and welcome to our uh, KPMG sponsored event uh, entitled Everybody's Business, How the Educated Sector and Employers Can Break Down uh, Geographical Disadvantage. Uh, just like to thank the sponsor KPMG for making today happen. Uh, my name is James Scales, I'm Head of Education at the Centre for Social Justice. Um, so I'll provide you with a bit of context uh, and then we're going to do a sort of interview style 30 minutes uh, and then we'll put uh, questions out to the floor. Um, so just to provide you with a bit of context about what we're going to speak about today. So prospects are shaped by geography. Um, we often think of geographical disadvantage as a north-south divide, uh, but it's, it's increasingly important to look at it in a more subtle way. I mean, sure, there's still disparities between, let's say, the northwest and the southeast, uh, but a more granular approach exposes that actually across the whole country we see uh, social mobility cold spots. Uh, what are these? Uh, these are areas where if you're disadvantaged, you have a particularly bad chance of progressing in life, both in terms of your educational outcomes and labour market prospects. Um, so what we have is 65 uh, social mobility cold spots throughout the country. Uh, and, and these span uh, all sorts of different areas, so coastal areas like Great Yarmouth and Blackpool, uh, old industrial towns like Stoke and Mansfield, these are all part of a patchwork of disadvantage that we see throughout the country. And disadvantage is, is relatively concentrated, we found recently, so uh, a fifth of the children in Fabian schools uh, live in just ten local authorities. Um, and the, the difference it can make is, is profound. So we know that uh, if you're living in one of the most disadvantaged areas in the country, you're 27 times more likely to go to an inadequate school. But change is possible. So people often speak about the London effect. Um, so if you are a, a kid in London who's on uh, free school meals or uh, a similar kind of uh, proxy for disadvantage, you're 52% more likely to get five GCSEs than someone who's a preschool male kid, but outside of London. So it shows that with the right blend of good policy and support at the local level, change is possible. So today uh, we have uh, two very distinguished guests. Uh, we have the Secretary of State for Education, the Right Honourable uh, Justin Green, an MP. Uh, Justine has made social mobility a cornerstone, a real, put it really at the heart of her policy agenda um, as Secretary of State and she'll be speaking about what the government's been doing in order to tackle a uh, geographical disadvantage. Uh, and we're also delighted to welcome Melanie Richards from KPMG. She's the Vice Chair of KPMG UK, uh, and she'll be bringing the employer's perspective and talking to us about uh, what employers can do to boost social mobility and tackle uh, this, this, this tough issue of geographical disadvantage. Um, so I'd like to, to open with a question uh, to Justine, please. Um, so you recently set up 12 opportunity areas. Um, and I'd be grateful if you could just share with the audience the rationale behind mm -hmm. uh, introducing those opportunity areas. What, what was the thinking behind it? Um, what are the prospects? What might we learn? And what could we apply elsewhere? For me personally, social mobility has been something that, well, it's shaped my own life. Um, and I think it's probably the most profound challenge our country faces um, over the coming years is how can we really level up opportunity? And I wanted to look at what we needed to do in some communities where schools had not been able to get the results that we wanted, not just for a few years, but actually for a long time. And once you start to look at that, and, and CSJ has been looking at that, but the Social Mobility Commission looked at that, what you see is that <coughs> they face numerous challenges. Some of them are inside school, but some of them are outside school. And therefore, if you really want to change things for the long term, you need to have a more uh, sophisticated, broad-based approach that tackles both of those things. So the opportunity areas were, first of all, looking at, looking at those places where there were cold spots, as you talked about. Um, we picked very different places because we know what will work maybe in Somerset will be very different to what would work in Oldham, which might be very different to what would work in Scarborough. So we deliberately picked a spread of places so that we can we can learn from them. And then the other thing about them is partnership. This is bringing together work inside schools with teachers and local head teachers, um, but also work outside school, in particular engaging communities, but also critically business, which is proving absolutely vital. 
uh, we know that's how we can raise aspirations, set ambitions high, and actually kids coming into school with a clearer sense of why it's so important that they do well is part of how they get into a classroom and are then ready to learn. Um, and I think the final thing I'll briefly say on it is we've worked to have one plan. So part of the problem, I think, in some of these communities is they've had lots of different initiatives that have you know, not always pulled in the same direction, not always maybe had the support of national government, maybe not always had backing from business, and yet there's been quite a lot of work going on. So what we tried to do is collectively take some responsibility for setting some clear priorities as a single team of the DfE people, community people, local authority and business, and then actually pursuing that. So one team, one plan that we're all committed to, and then being prepared to stick it for the long term. So it's a, a, in a way a different kind of politics and a different kind of policy delivery. Uh, it's more complex in some sense, um, but enables us to take an offer from the DfE and then tailor it. And I think that will give us a, a good prospect of success. Mm, thank you. And, and you mentioned that uh, one of the key aspects of this arrangement was to partner with, with uh, people on the ground in those areas. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned employers, so I'd like to bring Melanie in here. Uh, so, uh, I mean, KPMG has signed, well, signed up in the sense that they support opportunity areas. Uh, would you be able to explain the rationale behind that? So what was it that was attractive about supporting opportunity areas from a business perspective? So, um, as a business, we've been supporting this agenda for a very long time. We were early adopters of things like the living wage, so this isn't a new thing for us. Um, what, but one of the interesting things that you know Justine's touched upon is really understanding where the real disadvantaged areas that need support. And whilst we've got 22 offices across the country, um, they're not always necessarily directly located in places that are, need, are in need. So we were delighted when the areas were identified. In a way, it helps us understand <coughs> where the focus needs to be. Uh, and we uh, have signed up to uh, in East Anglia to two of the opportunity areas in East Anglia. Uh, and we've also are working. One of our partners uh, has joined the board of the DOE at the, in Norwich in the partnership mm -hmm. board there. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think there's, there's one thing to remember for, from an employer's perspective. Of course, this is about us wanting to attract talent as well and, and get to good, talented people. But also, uh, we can't forget that our people, uh, the people who work for us currently, are really interested in helping <coughs> and want to know how they can help with outreach. So a lot of our programs aren't just about are we uh, attracting talent and, and uh, enabling those people to join our organisation. But it's also about giving our people a, a, the opportunity to contribute. Mm. And do, do you think uh, it's something that all shapes and sizes of employers could get involved in, or is it only for the sort of the, the, the big companies like KPMG? Well, I, I think <coughs> what's really interesting about this latest initiative is is the desire to address organisations that don't just have the man or the you know the people power to do it. We we uh, have. Um, a good team, and in fact many of my team, I should thank them, uh, that are here today, who do an amazing job around the country. And you're right, we're geared up, and in fact we should be geared up as a large employer to do that. But I think one of the interesting things about this whole um, employer engagement, which is going on with the careers and enterprise company who we've been working with, is really it's getting to organisations that are large and small, and we're learning from each other. Mm. Thank you. Uh, just here, so obviously uh, opportunity areas are a very, uh, they're an example of very targeted intervention, uh, but there are lots of other policy levers that government have when it comes to broader structural uh, changes uh, that we could make to boost social mobility. Uh, so some people have spoken about uh, the difficulty of attracting teachers to more disadvantaged areas. Um, and I, one, one study I read recently said that uh, only 15% of teachers would consider actively moving to a school that was uh, more disadvantaged than the one that they were currently in. Um, so how can we organise our resources so that we, we pull in the best mm -hmm. teachers mm -hmm. into the areas that would benefit from the most? I mean, I think briefly just finishing off what Melanie was saying, uh, one of the things that we found interestingly is um, the opportunity areas have been um, almost like a clarion call for people who care about those communities to come forward and one of the interesting things in the DfE was when we announced the first six a whole load of people at the DfE got in touch going well I grew up in Norwich if you need any help volunteering or whatever 
let us know. And actually some of those people ended up being part of the actual teams working on the ground and, and they lend a real credibility to that work because of course they're people who are really invested in those communities from a, a personal perspective. Um, and we're also embedding lots of research in there um, so that we can really start to understand the different interventions we're putting in and working on and which bits work. But that kind of brings me on to your question. And I think that in relation to teacher recruitment and retention, um, we tried a number of things, um, but often they might have been overly blunt tools. And so again, what we're trying to do is target um, I would say there are a couple of main areas. Uh, one of them fundamentally is teaching as a profession and teaching as a, as a career. Uh, for me, I think it's a fantastic profession. It's a real vocation for the people who go into it. And yet, actually what they often find is that once they finish their initial teacher training and then suddenly get into their life as a teacher, the personal, the continued personal development they get can be either not there, or it can fall away quite quickly, um, or it's just very ad hoc. And so one of the first things we're doing is strengthening qualified teacher status and, and all of the, the CPD that sits around that, so that when teachers go into a, a new career, they're learning from those challenges that they face as they steadily you know, get into their jobs and, and into their careers, rather than simply seeing them as something to cope with. That they don't really grow from. So that, that's the first thing. And the second thing in a more targeted way is that we are now looking at how we can, for example, on maths, do uh, phased bursaries. So we will do a maths bursary, but actually it will, two thirds of it will be for when somebody starts initial teacher training, but then there'll be a final, a, a second chunk after year three and a, a further chunk after year five. We've also announced um, a, a loan um, repayment scheme. So if you set it alongside actually what we've also done on um, graduate threshold, actually for some teachers, by the time that's played in over the first six years of their career, by the end of it, they'll actually be gaining, with those two things together, around a thousand pounds. So that's quite an innovative way from us of looking at how we might want to look in the public sector around recruitment and retention. So I guess what I'm saying is some of it is about um, about the right kind of conversation, but some of it fundamentally is about actually trying to make sure that great careers can get started in some of the schools where they can make the most difference. And then the final thing I would say is a lot of this is about retention and development of the teaching talent that's already there. So it kind of comes back to the point around, you know, I grew up in Rotherham, I really care about my hometown, and I'm sure I probably care about it more than other people who didn't. Well, that's what a lot of teachers feel like. So one of the things we shouldn't lose sight of is, yes, let's get the best and brightest people encouraged to move into some of these areas and, and actually really uh, play a role in lifting standards. But let's also invest in the teaching capacity that's already there so that those teachers really can be at the top of their game. And often they're teaching children who've got a range of challenges so you know they've got some of the toughest roles and therefore we need to step up to the plate and helping them rise to the challenge of, of being fantastic um, in some more challenging circumstances than many other teachers might be used to facing day to day. Uh, and then just, just sticking on the theme of, uh, of, of teaching, um, you know, we could pull in the best teachers in the world um, we, we could only achieve so much in, in making them work ready. I think what a lot of people acknowledge is that um, for social mobility to really take off, we need lots of actors to be part of the mix, uh, and that includes employers. Um, so how, I mean, there's a big debate about how much teachers should <coughs> be taking on in terms of delivering careers advice, um, and how much employers could come in and help with that sort of thing. Um, in, in your view, what, what is the most effective balance between the teachers and the employers? How can employers help teachers to deliver that kind of work-ready support? Well, I, I do think that businesses have a responsibility inside this. I, I, I do think sometimes there's this sense that business should stand back and let government and, and you know, to solve all of the issues of the world. And, and societally, I think we all have a responsibility to contribute, and that's certainly the approach we've been taking uh, with our school interaction. So 
our interaction with schools isn't limited to um, the children that are about to start in the world of work. It goes right the way back into primary education and right the way through into secondary. And so we're working at any one time with about 30 primary schools and 100 secondary schools. We'll get to a large number of children at the primary level we're helping with literacy and numeracy skills and again it gives our people the opportunity to contribute and then at secondary level we'll be giving them opportunities to understand what the world of work is like. We run a program called Work Ready which we get to about 2,000 students with um, a year uh, in the summer and it's actually targeted at year 9 and 10 students and, and a lot of what we do is, is just introduce them to different ideas and different things, whether it's technology, uh, but also give them skills, uh, help them understand what actually happens in work, what problem solving looks like, what working in groups and teams might look like. And of course, the purpose of this isn't to inspire them to become necessarily accountants or tax people or technologists, it's to inspire them to think about what they might want to be doing and what work might be. So it's, it's opening their minds, and I do think that we have a big part to play in that. Does that mean that schools shouldn't be good, giving good careers advice? Absolutely not. But, but actually, we need to, to equip schools with the information so that they, they can pass it into their student body. And Justine, uh, there are stats that suggest that 34% of FSM uh, students who are in exactly the same neighbourhood um, get exactly the same grades, uh, they're 34% more likely to drop out at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. So it suggests that they don't necessarily have access to the same sort of uh, social capital that maybe mm -hmm. other more advantaged um, students might have. Um, how <coughs> do the government plug or help plug that gap? What sort of schemes has it introduced or could it introduce in order to, to level the playing field? When I, so when I went into the DfE, I, I said I really wanted to look at three things. You know, great education is about knowledge and skills, it's about great experiences that help young people develop, and it's about getting the right advice at the right time. And I thoroughly endorse uh, what Melanie has just said. The Careers and Enterprise Company has only been in existence a couple of years, but really is starting to do some great work at scale actually working with employers around the country and I think we've recognized what we've got to do is make it simple so making it simple for great companies like KPMG to be able to do what you already want to do is part of the solution big and small companies and I think with the careers enterprise company all of the evidence that they have pulled together shows that when young people come into contact four times with sort of different sort of work experiences or different kinds of mentoring it really disproportionately shapes their resilience in terms of being able to go into the workplace and it opens up their horizons and you know I, from my personal experience I never thought of doing a law degree I'd never met a lawyer when I was growing up so I had absolutely no idea about what law was about or whether it's something I'd ever want to study and I think now the increased involvement of business at an earlier stage in, in setting sites high, there's some great research that showed that I think if by 10 you've already made your mind up that you want to go to university, you're something like six times more likely to go. And I think what that's really telling is, is if at that age you've already set yourself some goals, you're much more likely to achieve them, um, then actually companies uh, and discussions uh, at an early stage in primary matter, uh, I think we can bring to bear technology, so it doesn't all have to be face to face these days, you know, the ability to get mentoring and Skyping really starts to open up much more opportunity for kids getting great careers advice. And Melanie, we know how important it is that employers get on board, um, how easy is it uh, for employers to engage, for instance, if you want to offer work experience? Uh, you know, what would one do? And, and would that change if you were you know, a big company rather than a, a small FME? Um, is it easy to engage? Well, I think um, it's been quite difficult for smaller employers to do it up until now. And I think Justine's quite right. I was in fact asked this question a little earlier today as to what I thought the Careers and Enterprise Company was doing. And I think it is that scale and that accessibility into schools, into the right students that need to be, you know, we need to pay attention to. And so I think those sorts of, of collaborations are really helping. 
there are also some great organisations in fact we've got the Social Mobility Foundation here I think and uh, and we work with them and they've helped us do residential work placements with uh, students that wouldn't necessarily are, are in areas where we're not necessarily operating so we give them the, the opportunity to come closer to where our work is and then they get a quite unique experience so I think there are a lot of organisations. I think actually finding your way around them is quite difficult as an employer, unless you've got the resource that the KPMG, which we and a wonderful team that does that, which is why I think things like the Careers and Enterprise Company and this getting people to talk to each other is helping so much. And what, what is a reasonable ask? Uh, if, if we're going to ask employers to get on board, how, how much should we expect employers to be taken on the load? Well, I think I've already said how I personally feel about it. And I, I do think that, uh, I don't think it's appropriate for business to hold back and, and think that it's going to be, this is going to be solved by somebody else. Uh, that said, obviously different businesses have different levels of resource. I'm a great believer in collaboration. Um, an example of that is we led uh, an initiative with a number of the other firms called Access Accountancy, which was, was set up a number of years ago because we could see this issue and we wanted to make sure that, that we as an industry got together in thinking about how we solve. And I think there could be a lot more of that going on. Industries rather than individual companies taking the lead. Um, the other thing I think is um, quite quite important is, is, is the question of school outreach, and I've touched on that already. Um, I don't think we, should, we can underestimate how much of that could be done, and, and one of the things we're looking at is an e-platform e as to whether we can get our people involved in, in that way. Now, when, when you ask the question how reasonable it is, I think you have to scale it depending on the size of business, but I do think everybody should be contributing. Yeah, I think it's. I think you know what Melanie's setting out is how business can be <coughs> a real uh, force for good in helping us be really successful in Brexit Britain, and and actually we've got a common goal because any country's biggest asset is its people, and actually yes, education and the policy we've got and, and the reforms we're bringing forward can help drive standards, but actually employers can play a role in that as well, because it's not just coming out with the pure academic accomplishments, actually what we want coming out of our school system are, are much more rounded young people that can really go into the workplace and do their best. And and I think that the, the, the final key to this really for me, that I've said for some time now, is understanding how as you do that progression of a young person out of the education system into their career proper, how uh, we can see businesses work more smartly together to really bring through the best and the brightest and then actually really to get a sense of how to talent manage collectively in terms of leveling the playing field because what we know is that even you know for disadvantaged kids coming out of university with the same grades or sometimes even better grades, their earning potential will still be behind their, you know, more advantaged peers. And, and so that's not something we should accept, because actually what it suggests is that um, we're not using our human capital in our country uh, as effectively as we could, and, and that's not only the right thing to do. So social mobility isn't just the right thing to do, it's actually a smart thing to do from an economic and productivity perspective. And, and frankly, I, I believe that people want to be able to achieve their potential, wherever that takes them. Mm. I mean, and we should be enabling that. Well, one of the things we haven't touched on, of course, is apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I do think, coming back to your question about business, I do think it is our responsibility to produce high quality apprenticeships that, that lead to, to something, you know, very purposeful and lead to something. And, it's, and from my perspective, when, when I look at, in fact, we've got an apprentice in the room, one of our apprentices, she, been quite busy today, hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you know, we have to bring young people in who are going to end up with a qualification, that they are going to end up with a career path inside our organisations. And I think the more that we can focus on apprenticeships that, that provide that, the, the better. And on, on the theme of technical vocational education, uh, from a policy perspective, um, Justine, I mean, how much potential is there to try and break through? Uh, 
poverty uh, cycles between different generations at local level and replace that instead with a virtuous cycle of uh, learning and, and positive uh, outcomes and uh, strong local employment. Um, I know that uh, there are some exciting new policies being put forward to, to radically overhaul uh, the system of technical education mm. to try and give it more prestige and get it up there along with its academic cousin. Um, but how much potential do you think exists uh, to boost uh, disadvantaged people's chances by reforming technical education? I think it's critical because the reality is that if you're young and disadvantaged, you, you're much more likely to end up going through the technical education system today. I mean, that's just a statistical fact. Um, and you are less likely, compared to one of your better peers, to end up going to university. Um, but in and of itself, we need to do technical education reform because it should be a gold standard route for whether you, whatever kind of background you're from. If that's the how you want to complete your education, that should be something that's high quality. And, and so what we've done is obviously have a huge focus on improving academic standards. And actually, it, it is good news that we're seeing um, more young people heading to university, more disadvantaged young people heading to university. But that, that's the right option for half of our young people. For the other half, we've now got to improve and reform that technical education path that they want to go uh, go down so that it's every bit as good. Just because that's a different choice for them, it shouldn't be a worse choice. And what we're going to be doing is bringing forward these T levels, which will sit alongside A levels as a technical uh, qualification. Uh, we're going to build the technical ladder alongside apprenticeships as part of that overall offer to young people and we're really going to be developing our homegrown talent and that's great for young people who at the moment probably feel like they'd like something better quality. Actually it's critical for business because when you look at how many technicians for example we're producing compared to Germany it's much lower proportion yet we've got a huge need. So, this is a massive win-win for our country if we can finally nail this. And the key is parity of esteem and, and demonstrating that actually these routes for young people are going to be high quality, they're going to be collaborating with, uh, with employers and that we're going to be delivering them together. And just before I open up to the floor, uh, Mel, KPMG have done some fantastic work on social mobility. They came second uh, in the recent Employer Social Mobility Index. That, that really is something that needs to be applauded because it's great work. Would you mind just sharing um, some of the examples that have got them to that position, please? Well, I, I think I've covered a few of them, actually. But um, I suppose um, we're very proud of our apprenticeship programme. Um, we call this our 360 programme. And, and it gives uh, the young people who join us an opportunity to see a number of different things as they come in and then they get a chance and opportunity to specialise and end up with a really full-fledged um, uh, qualification. And I think what's been most rewarding is to see us improve um, our statistics and uh, people coming in from disadvantaged backgrounds into their apprenticeships. And we, we, as you know, and many of these people in the room will be very familiar with the whole range of measures that we use, but we've seen progression both in terms of um, children whose parents haven't gone to university and uh, those who've benefited from school, school meals. And that, that statistic has, has moved up quite dramatically. Um, I think the other thing we're, we are proud of is the school outreach. Um, we also sponsor a, a school in Hackney, the City Academy, which we've been involved in like, for nine years now. And we've seen it um, really, really develop. And, and the interesting thing about that is it's not just about going in and doing outreach. We're actually supporting with governors. We're supporting with mentoring the actual teachers as well. Uh, and, and, and the results have spoken for themselves. And we're very proud of the, you know, the teachers and the students and the teachers there. Um, I think the, the other last thing is that um, is I'm going to just touch on data. It would kind of be disappointing if the KPMG didn't talk about data. Um, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a passionate believer that you have to measure things. And uh, we did take uh, what some would regard either as a brave or a stupid step, but I, I'd like to think of it as neither. Just something that is the right thing to do, which is starting to publish much more data. And we're constantly testing ourselves on what data we should publish, um, how we get to the data actually, because of course collecting the data can be quite difficult. 
and then once we have the data is, is what actually happens to people who join our organisation, so the point you were making about whether people are progressing at the same level and so forth, and that's the next piece of work that we're doing. So I, I'm a big um, advocate for businesses publishing these data. Um, because I think the more data we have, the more meaningful interventions we can make and we can work out what is and isn't working. And the reality is not everything that we've done has worked over a decade. Uh, and the only way we know that is by measuring it. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to open up to the floor. Wow, that's quite a few questions. Um, <laughs> probably, wait, I couldn't see who got there first. The chap at the back of the room. Um, could, could everyone just state their name and their organisation, please, before asking a question? Thanks. Uh, Nathan from the Delta Institute. I've just come from another event with uh, Ian Duncan Smith, where he described um, family breakdown as a major crisis in the UK. And uh, of course, you know, uh, what happens in the family is a huge determinant of then what happens in the classroom. Um, and so a question for the Secretary of State, do you agree with uh, IDS that family breakdown is a major crisis in the UK? And if you do, um, what more should the government be doing to uh, tackle it? I think, I think Ian's right that um, when families break down, it has quite a profound impact on children often growing up in those families. And that's why um, it's a recognition of that, in a way, that's led us to do the opportunity areas. It's about saying we need to understand what's happening outside the classroom if we also want to improve uh, things inside the classroom. And one of the things, interestingly, I announced at conference um, earlier this week on Sunday was around looking at how we can improve alternative provision. If you look at the children who are in alternative provision, 80% of them will have a special educational need of some sort, and overwhelmingly, they might be the most challenging, but they're also often the most vulnerable children. And therefore, it's really important that we look at how we can improve uh, what's happening in the sort of provision, understand the best practice. At the moment, I mean, a shocking statistic is that only 4% of those <coughs> people who are in AP will come out with a, an A star to C in maths or English as a G, at GCSE. That's compared to 64% of young people in mainstream schools and, and so these these people coming out of the, the school system for them, which often they've ended up in alternative provision because of things going on around them that have been difficult to cope with and yet it dictates their future in a way that none of us should be prepared to accept. So I agree he's right and actually I think what, what we're all recognising is that we have, need to have an overall approach on education but there are some people we've talked about geographically in some communities, but also some young people because of their particular individual circumstances that need a much more tailored approach and, and cannot be uh, left out of the equation. Uh, lady in the front row. Thank you. I'd like to go back to your first question, actually, Jane, about attracting teachers to the most disadvantaged areas. Sorry, I'm, I'm from, uh, my name is Karen, I'm from the NFBR, the National Foundation for Educational Research. And one of the pieces uh, of data that we found recently is that multi-academy trusts are actually quite good at getting teachers mm -hmm. where they need to go. So we found that the dynamics within the trust, mm -hmm. so that they can move teachers to where they're needed, they're more likely to move within a trust and between schools generally. So that seems to be quite an interesting way to get teachers where they're needed the most. And I wonder whether there's any other uh, particular opportunities for multi academy trusts and schools working together, as well as business and community working together, that could be taken advantage of. Well, on that, I mean, you're absolutely right. And when you talk to people running maths, they very much look around career progression. So they will look across the family of schools that are within the MAD and really start to look ahead to match up where they feel um, deputy and, and then future head teachers can be. And I think that's part of it. And they're, they're maybe able to do that in a more strategic way than perhaps schools that are not part of that. Um, and actually, when you, again, I talked about continuing professional development we're really learning from what good looks like and again there are some maths, not all by any means, but certainly some maths that really do have a very rigorous, robust, successful <coughs> approach on CPD and, and I think we can learn from them in that fashion. Of course what I also want to see is maths being in parts of the country and the community where 
actually. We know that the Great Ones can make such a big difference and, and I want to see Matt's join this next phase, if you like, of lifting education standards, um, but being prepared to go with us um, in some places where actually they've been less, less keen to go for various reasons, and that's important. Thanks. Can we take a question on the role of employers? Has someone got something to say? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, John Craven from Preach, the social mobility charity. We partner with KPMG and about 20 other universities and employers. Um, and we, we're great, it's great to work in partnership. Many of the employers we work with and some of those that don't um, are uh, located in London or the Manchester mm -hmm. regional offices, but a lot of the resource that they commit to social mobility is often in local schools. So, what I've seen both as a teacher and working in a bank is that actually in London, a lot of the, the pupils are getting some really, really good, good opportunities. So I think it's really great to see the focus on the cold spots and the opportunity areas. But my question is, how can we make sure that the employers that are often, you know, have got the resource to commit and often based in London are spreading that to, whether it's uh, Mansfield or, or these other areas in the Northeast and, and, and so on? Well, I think I think the identi as I said earlier, I think the, the fact that we've identified opportunity areas and we know where we're meant to be targeting our resources a step forward. I think a practical question you're really posing is if all your resources a long way away from where it needs to be, how do you bridge that gap? And I think that's why I'm quite excited by the idea of e-volunteering because a lot of a lot of what we do is use and harness the resource of our people to support the things that we're doing and if we can and if, and it's not a perfect you know it's a way of doing it but if we can create some form of technological intervention as well as a physical in-person intervention then i think we'll be able to get to more people i think though that, that there's no question I mean, as i said we've got we happen to have 22 offices across the country and even with that spread of offices across the country we're not you know cheap by jail by in some of these areas and I do think, though, that, that employers are prepared to go out, and I think it's opening their eyes to the other opportunities around the country to support, as much as whether they're physically located in the same spot. Thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, so can I thank KPMG once again for sponsoring this thank event you. and making it happen? Uh, can I thank the Secretary of State so much for attending today? And Melanie Richards, thank you also so much. It was a very good conversation. And thank you all for attending.